the world has gone mad. And when the world demands justice, only the mad can bring it. In 1979, George Miller, Byron Kennedy, and a small Australian film crew brought Mad Max to the world. A film made with barely any budget and by creators hoping to break into the film industry in any way they could. And the way they found was through Ozploitation, a regional offshoot of the growing trend of micro-budget exploitation movies that let new filmmakers break into theaters with a cheap film and an irresistible genre hook. Starring Mel Gibson, back when his insanity was an asset to the characters he played, Mad Max is set in the near future as society has begun to crumble, with only the officers of the main force patrol standing between the innocents and the insane gangs that have taken over the roads. It's a world of lawlessness, and when Max loses his family to Toe Cutter and his gang, his sanity slips, and revenge becomes the only way to make sense of the world. In the decades afterward, Miller would shoot three more Mad Max movies, each building upon the apocalyptic mythology of his humble indie original and growing in scope, depth, and style. In retrospect, the original Mad Max is an outlier in a series of stories where the seeds of hope are planted in a wasteland by a broken man. But none of it would be possible without Miller and company's first foray into a dark world of road justice. To understand the world of Mad Max, we'll explore the exploitation genre boom that gave Miller and company their chance to make it in a country that had only started to build its own film industry. The influences that led Miller to create a story of highway carnage and madness, and the unmistakable blend of brutality and cartoonishness that turned Mad Max into an Ozploitation classic, whose influence can still be felt around the world today. Exploitation films have existed for almost as long as film itself, with creators using taboo topics and boundary-pushing content to attract audiences and make up for their lack of budget. But the true wave of exploitation cinema crested in the 60s and 70s. As the Hays Code ended, restrictions laxed, and the grindhouse and drive-in boomed across the US. Suddenly, filmmakers with little budget had both a means of production and distribution. As for the term, exploitation came to define a focus on lurid taboo topics that let audiences feel like they were violating societal norms without actually breaking laws. The exploitation umbrella would quickly splinter into countless subgenres, and it's here where Ozploitation began. The Australian Film Commission was founded in 1975 by the Australian government, with the intent to kickstart the then non-existent Australian film industry. And it worked. The result was the Australian New Wave, marked by more prestigious films like Peter Weir's Picnic at Hanging Rock. And alongside it came the local wave of exploitation cinema, later termed Ozploitation, which looked to take advantage of the R rating, which was only created in Australia in 1971. Here, stories set in the outback and with a distinctly Aussie viewpoint captured an aesthetic that no other country could. And in this sudden explosion of film made fast and cheap arrived George Miller. A young Miller had one foot in the medical world and one foot in the film world studying medicine at the University of New South Wales and completing his residency at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. All the while, Miller attended film workshops and shot experimental films on the side, with his interest in movie making leading to his friendship with filmmaker Byron Kennedy. Together, the two formed Kennedy Miller Productions and dreamed of breaking into the film industry. In the years between his residency and Mad Max's production, Miller worked in a Sydney emergency room, and the career both gave him the money to afford jumping into a film career with no guarantees, and countless experiences treating horrifying car crash injuries. This, along with the death of several friends in car accidents as a teen, led Miller to center his idea for a feature film on road-based action, with a future dystopian setting giving a reason behind the carnage. Miller and Kennedy soon hired James McCausland, Melbourne finance editor of The Australian, to write the script. With Miller providing a detailed outline and being heavily involved with the film's thematics and story structure, while McCausland focused on dialogue. 
McCausland was inspired by the 1973 oil crisis, saying, George and I wrote the script based on the thesis that people would do almost anything to keep vehicles moving, and the assumption that nations would not consider the huge costs of providing infrastructure for alternative energy until it was too late. Made without the involvement of the Australian government, Miller and company raised funds on their own with Miller and Kennedy working on emergency medical calls to help foot the bill. In the end, Mad Max cost somewhere between 350 and 400,000 Australian dollars, with the film shot using only a single camera, one crane, and five used lenses bought for cheap after they were damaged in a previous film production. Besides the still learning Miller, there was inexperience in front of the camera as well. Gibson had done some plays. Hugh Keysburn was more established but mostly a stage actor. And a lot of Toe Cutter's followers were from actual biker gangs. Paid in beer and bonding with Keysburn on a massive motorcycle road trip that got the bikes to set before filming began. In my eyes, the rawness is obvious on screen, but it makes the film one of a kind. The story of Mad Max is so simple that it's exploitation cinema to a T. An apocalyptic civilization breeds chaos. Broken down lawman goes on a revenge spree after the murder of his family. I think you could apply most of that description to about 500 different movies that were made over the decades. Both big budget studio jobs and indies shot in the director's backyard. What makes Mad Max different, and something that's still exciting to watch decades later, is that George Miller's voice, already so distinct in his first feature film, informs everything here. And for a movie that was renowned for its violence when it premiered, what makes Mad Max one of a kind is that its brutality is counterbalanced by its cartoonishness. First, the brutality. Mad Max exists in a world set a few years from now where society has broken down due to oil shortages, with desperate civilians running scared from the wild gangs that have taken over the road. Miller thrusts us into this mid-apocalyptic conflict at the very start, with a chase between the main force patrol and the criminal known as the Knight Rider. The ways in which both cop and criminal care little for their lives or the lives of anyone else illustrate how this will be a story where lives are cheap, and the thrill of the chase is more important than finding justice. And while we're quickly introduced to our cast of characters, it's MFP officer Goose, played by Steve Bisley, and Max, who seem like the only ones truly capable of matching the speed and ferocity of the gangs. With Hugh Keys Burns toe cutter swearing revenge on Max and the MFP for Knight Rider's death. Mad Max's opening chase is all about picking up as much speed as possible, and the shreds of metal and plastic that fly off every car add to the sense of danger and very real impact of every hit. The film immediately contrasts this with Max's quiet, happy home life, with Gibson's Max and Joanne Samuel's Jesse having an easy, calm sort of chemistry that's at direct odds with the rest of the film's manic state. And despite its rawness, Mad Max holds back on so much of its potential graphic violence. Instead, Miller chooses to suggest the worst of the worst, instead of actually showing it. And I think that given what were probably real budget limitations on how effective its blood and gore could actually be, Mad Max is stronger for implying its horrors instead of showing them, because it allows for the imagination to run wild. Instead, we see the reactions of those who witness carnage. And since this is ultimately a movie about mental breakdown that mirrors societal breakdown, the toll seen on Max's mind is what matters most. The two best examples of this are in Max visiting the horribly burned goose in the hospital, where the colors and lighting shift the most dramatically in the entire film, leading to a fever dream with Max popping right up into a shaft of light to accentuate his internal torment. The other is the most tragic moment of the film, with Jesse and Little Sprague run down by the motorcycle gang. It's horrible, but Miller uses only a shoe and a ball to illustrate the carnage. We're using the innate emotion of knowing what's happened. We don't need to actually see anything. Miller is a storyteller who uses big emotions, operatic themes. But while the toll of death is a recurring element in his films, he's not cruel. Mad Max is far from perfect, and the shortcomings are felt most in the script not being completely confident in itself, with plot beats sometimes taking multiple attempts before moving the story forward. Like Goose getting in a motorcycle crash, being fine, getting another car, and then being attacked by the toe cutter. Or Jesse having a run-in with the gang, escaping, 
thinking they're chasing after her, and then running into them again for the fatal rundown. It's things like this that illustrate Miller still in the process of growing more confident and lean with his scripts. And the difference between the original Mad Max and something like Fury Road decades later illustrates that what Miller is best at isn't just creating bigger, wilder worlds, but having the confidence in knowing when and where to not hold the audience's hand. Of course, this was Miller's intention with his original film as well, with the director stating that he intended it to be a silent movie with sound. Mad Max was shot in a style that Miller would later describe as guerrilla filmmaking, with cast and crew assembling the film often without permits in and around Melbourne. Sometimes, props were stolen and returned after filming finished. Cars were pulled together from various sources, including Miller's own blue Mazda Bongo van, and smashed to pieces. Other cars, especially the MFP's Pursuit Specials, were modified to suit the world of the film and the high-speed needs of both cops and criminals. And unlike many big-budget productions, the cars and motorcycles of Mad Max were fully functional, road-ready vehicles. Not stunt cars or facades. Well, besides that painted-on fake truck grill. That was made to keep from damaging the borrowed tractor trailer. Crew would blaze down the tiny backwoods highways of Australia, hitting insane speeds for the sake of the shot, and getting it done before they could be questioned. To hit an even higher speed, a military booster rocket was strapped to the back of the Knight Rider's car in his chase-ending crash. You can see it right there. Part of the viscerality of Mad Max's car chases, which are the driving force of the entire film, is that they feel raw and unpolished. While it's all done by professionals, the on-the-fly, low-budget nature removes artifice. There was no extra money or cars for second takes, and the flying debris, crashes, and motorcycles hitting heads were all captured on the first take and used for chases that excite, not because they're perfectly choreographed or feature insane special effects, but because the reality of cars blazing down the open Australian road creates verisimilitude, with even greater danger created by the Kuleshov effect of intercutting innocent civilians and increasingly stressed drivers into the road carnage on display. Stuntman Grant Page executed most of the movie's stunts despite being hospitalized for a bike crash while traveling the set, and would go on to perform in The Road Warrior and Beyond Thunderdome, with Page saying, The essence of stunts is to make it look as dangerous as possible, and make damn sure it's not. Obviously, the jump through the splintering caravan is a highlight, but the final chase with Max after Toe Cutter is fantastic, thanks to the viscerality of a stuntman on a bike just a few feet away from the blazing V8 Interceptor, one of my favorite movie cars. The goal, it seems, of the MFP is to chase down their targets until sheer speed and a simple mistake leads to a fatal crash, and Toe Cutter's death, complete with a prop head eye pop for added, did I just see that surprise, is no different. Still, despite all those moments that are burned into the memories of Mad Max fans, shooting the film was an incredible challenge. In fact, the pressure Miller felt was so strong that he nearly stepped down as director before the cast and crew threatened to quit if he did. The film was a complete disaster to me in terms of what I wanted to do, said Miller. I really thought I wasn't cut out to make films. I had no money for an editor, so I cut the film myself for a year. And every day for a year, I was faced with the evidence of what I hadn't done what I'd failed to do, every day facing this film, this wreck. But when Mad Max was finally released in 1979 in Australia, and around the world the following year, Miller's film was a sensation. American International presents Mad Max, the maximum force of the future. All of these elements would make Mad Max feel like a dire, desperate experience, if it weren't for the outlandish, exaggerated touches that flavor everything in this film. Hugh Keysburn makes Toe Cutter an absolutely flamboyant caricature, constantly zigging and zagging in his over-the-top reactions to everything. <laughs> Side characters like Police Chief Fifi and the voice box using Charlie feel like Miller and McCausland satirizing the typical stock characters found in a movie police department. Well, damn them! You want me, man? The heroes. Max and Julie are like the worst parents ever, but I think Miller is aware of that as an element of his story, and it's ultimately their neglecting of Sprague that destroys their lives. Little touches, like Brian May's saxophone score suddenly revealed to be Julie playing the sax off screen, are winks and nods to let us in on the joke. 
And of course, there's Miller and cinematographer David Egby speeding up the footage of their chases. This allows the stunt drivers to perform at safer speeds, but it also gives the chases an unnatural quality of movement that feels like a Looney Tune come to life. Because everything is heightened, we can enjoy the carnage just a little more, until Max's life comes crashing down as his infant son is killed and his wife lies near death. It's here that the cartoonishness, at least somewhat present throughout every scene before, is stripped away, and Max kills each gang member in a life and body sacrificing path of revenge. With Gibson putting in a feral, almost completely mute performance for the climax of the film, Mad Max is about getting pushed past the point of breaking. That point is different for every character, and for the world they're in. Highway lines are the recurring visual motif of the film, with long shots skimming right above the blacktop as our characters blaze their way across the wilderness. Sometimes these shots are more gentle, pushing along in peace. At other times, the dashed lines shoot across the screen as both the camera operator and characters chase their targets in the seconds before death. In either case, it's a hypnotic effect, and Max is consumed by a hypnotic, vengeful state. So much of Mad Max feels like it's just barely keeping the illusion of its world together, with the film crew often shooting at very specific angles to capture barren nature, and not the houses and businesses that were just a few feet away. But the scrappiness of this production would give way to an expansion and reiteration of its ideas, as budgets and skills grew in sequels. The closest other series I can think of is Sam Raimi's Evil Dead trilogy, which has a very similar progression in films, moving from micro-budget production that found unexpected success to a sequel where the essence of the original became both honed and extremely exaggerated, to a third film where the franchise went in a completely different direction and employed a medieval aesthetic. Major shifts, but still under the same guiding voices. And that was possible because Mad Max would go on to make $100 million worldwide for a time becoming the most profitable film ever made, even if its US release was compromised by terrible dubbing that tried to remove the Aussiness of it all. You okay, Goose? Nothing a year in the tropics wouldn't fix. With three more Mad Max films made after the original and a Furiosa prequel on the way, Miller's small-scale revenge thriller has given life to a vibrant world that's evolved into a mythological tale where each film acts like a new cycle of Ragnarok. And in the process, Miller's original movie has less and less in common with the larger series. And what makes it the most different is that structurally, Mad Max is a tragedy. There's two halves to this film. The first is a story of cops and criminals where society and sanity is barely holding on, climaxing and ending with Goose's burning and Max leaving the force. Really, Max is a supporting character here. Its second half is a tragic story of loss and revenge, focused on Max's family after they've left society for an indefinite vacation, only for Toe Cutter and his gang to target them. Max running Toe Cutter to his death and then forcing the unstable and frankly abused Johnny the Boy to choose between his foot and death has no sense of satisfaction or resolution. Just violence leading to more violence. In the end, a mentally broken Max leaves society, driving off into the unknown wasteland. And this is what ultimately differentiates the original from its sequels. As a tragedy and not a hero's journey, Max loses everything and pushes into the unknown, never to come back which is the opposite of the heroic cycle that defines every other Max Rokotansky story. Yes, in those stories, Max ultimately returns to the wasteland, but as a mythic figure who's found redemption. Here, Max's victory is hollow. More than 40 years later and with multiple sequels taking its promise and fulfilling it, the original Mad Max seems small and incomplete in comparison, but it's still special. It's an example of filmmakers putting everything they have on the line in the hopes of breaking through. And in Miller and Company's case, they did it. As for the road warrior, he'll live on forever on film. Thanks for watching today's video. I love the Mad Max film. And if you're watching this video, you probably do too. But what I've always found is interesting is that despite the series' popularity, the original Mad Max is probably the least discussed. 
The Road Warrior is a classic that completely solidified the idea of the series. Beyond Thunderdome is an interesting mix of both the best and worst of the series. And of course, Fury Road is one of the greatest movies of all time. But Mad Max itself, the original, is this scrappy indie production that was outclassed by the movies that followed it, with especially The Road Warrior fulfilling the promise of that original movie. But I find Mad Max to be really interesting and still entertaining even if it is very flawed. You can really see the seams of the production when you watch this movie, but there's still something really special about it. So I hope that even if you're not a huge fan of this original, you enjoyed this video talking about it. Because some of these elements like the car chases and the wackiness of a lot of the scenes like that saxophone reveal, and of course the V8 Interceptor are classics. And like I said in the video, I liken this series a lot to Evil Dead. That mix of scrappy original to awesome sequel to extremely different third movie. Although I don't find a lot of similarities between the Evil Dead reboot and Fury Road, besides them both being very intense. And in my perspective, the filmmaking stories of Mad Max are just as interesting and maybe a little more interesting than the film itself. And the career of George Miller is fascinating to me. He has swung so wildly between different genres and tones and audiences. Although you can always tell it's him. Like, if you watch Babe Pig in the City, it's like, yeah, this is the Mad Max guy that made this really messed up movie for dang ass freaks. Crazy movie. Babe Pig in the City is more messed up than any of the Mad Max movies. Anyway, besides that tangent, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the original Mad Max and the series overall. I made a Fury Road video a few years ago, so go check that out. And even longer ago, I made a video on The Road Warrior. But I am thinking about remaking that video, because I think I could do that movie so much more justice now. So if you're interested in those, check them out and let me know if you'd like another Road Warrior video, as well as a video on Beyond Thunderdome, because we gotta complete the series, right? And of course, when Furiosa comes out next year, I'll talk about that too. As always, thank you to my patrons for their continued support, and if you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only reviews. Currently, I'm doing a Patreon exclusive every month where I recap what I've watched and read and played in the month prior giving mini reviews on all sorts of different films and books and video games. And I'm also starting a series where I ask my patrons to vote in a poll that will determine an exclusive review for every month. So go check that out if you'd like to be a patron. And until next time, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and preserving your precious guzzoline for when you need it most.